All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Valerie. I am the owner of Tusame Books. Um, so I will just begin by saying if that we are recording this event. And so if you are not comfortable having your video taken, please feel comfortable to turn your cameras off. And then secondly, because we'd like to be able to hear our speakers, uh, please make sure to keep your mics muted. If you have any questions, we are going to be tracking them on the chat function. So please feel free to drop your questions in there. All right. So I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. To Summit Books is an online bookstore operating across the traditional territories of many indigenous nations. We acknowledge the indigenous peoples who are traditional stewards of the land where we work and where we live. Our home office is located in the territories of the Anishinaabeg, the Cree, the Dakota, the Dene, the Métis and Uji Cree nations. We work alongside our indigenous brothers and sisters to transform systems through literature and education for a better, more conscious and more loving society. Tonight's event is brought to you by collaboration between our bookstore, Tusome Books, Renaissance Press and African Anthology. In a few minutes, I will introduce Greg Frankson, who is our host tonight. But before that, I would like to tell you a little bit about our bookstore. As most of you probably know, we are an online bookstore only. We carry physical books, audiobooks, and a small selection of ebooks. Our focus is on marginalized voices because it's high time for these voices to receive the space that they deserve. Uh -huh. so my books create I'm not a typo in my thing. To some my books creates a platform for Canadian Indigenous authors, people of color people with disabilities and or chronic illnesses and those who identify as 2SLGBTQ. The core piece in our business is to focus on intentional reading. This is a practice of focusing on a specific subject area or an issue while reading. For us, that issue is literature by minority authors or centering issues affecting minority groups. We invite you all to join the movement by either signing up for our newsletter by joining our book club or requesting a curated reading list to get you started on your intentional reading journey. So once again, welcome. At this point, I would like to introduce Greg. So Greg Frankson is, an, is a Toronto-based poet, an author, an educator, and community activist. He has published three poetry collections, including Cerebral Stimulation, Lead on a Page, and a weekly dose of Ritalin. Greg's work also appeared in the anthologies Mike Check, The Not Forgotten, and The Great Black North. He has released four album length studio recordings and collaborated musically with several notable MCs, DJs, and vocalists. He appeared on the CBC TV's Canada's Smartest Person in 2012 and is a former resident poet on the CBC Radio One program here. Oh, sorry, CBC Radio One program here and now Toronto. He has been facilitating and speaking at mental health and anti-discrimination events across Canada for over two decades. He has participated in gatherings in North America and internationally, penning poetic reflections on the current state of global mental health systems. He served as a poet laureate of the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership and has worked on projects with the Wellesley Institute, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, among others. In December 2010, Greg was profiled by Who's Who in Black Canada. In 2012, he won a National Poetry Slam Championship. He was inducted in 2013 to the Vice Ottawa Hall of Honor for his contributions to the advancement of poetry in the National Capital Region. In 2014, Greg was nominated for a, Black, for a Black Canadian Award for Best Spoken Word. In addition to his artistic achievements, Greg was the first African Canadian to serve a term as president of Canada's oldest undergraduate government at Queen's University in 1996 to 1997, and was a vocal advocate for the on-campus recognition of Robert Sutherland. 
Canada's first Black university graduate and the first Black lawyer in British North America. In October 2009, Queen's officially rededicated its policy studies building as Robert Sutherland Hall. And with that, Greg, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very, uh, very appreciative of this opportunity to be here uh, with all of you, those of you who have joined us and have tuned in uh, to be here on, on this stream. I'm very grateful uh, that you are able to be with us tonight and um, also very uh, appreciative of the opportunity to have a couple of the other artists uh, who appear in the, uh, in the collection uh, here along with me as well. So you see, I've got a copy right here in my hands. This is African Anthology Perspectives of Black Canadian Poets. It is the book that we released on the 1st of February and contains uh, just under two dozen artists from coast to coast we're writing about different things that they uh, experience in their lives uh, as Black people in this country, as Black artists, as Black writers. And so we wanted to do more than just simply provide an opportunity for folks to share their artistry. So there are many poems in the collection, but there are also conversations and a piece of short fiction, but mostly also personal essay that really does talk about the Black experience uh, in Canada. And so this evening, um, I'm very pleased to say that I will be joined here by, uh, you know, alongside with uh, Bertram Bickerstaff, Truth Is, and Asante Houghton. So Truth and Bertrand are on the call at the moment. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Asante was held up for a few minutes, but he should be joining us in the next couple of minutes. So what I'd like to do is first start off by just reading their bios so you folks have an understanding of who these folks are. So uh, Bertrand Bickerstaff is a poet, playwright, essayist, and educator who was born in Sierra Leone and raised in Alberta. His collection of poetry, The Response of Weeds, was a finalist for multiple awards and won both the League of Canadian Poets Gerald Lampert Memorial Award, and the Writer Guild of, Ont of Alberta's Stephen G. Stephenson Award for Poetry. His writing has appeared in many places, including CBC's The Next Chapter, The Walrus, Prairie, Fra Prairie Fire, The Sprawl, and the CBC project Black on the Prairies. He lives in Calgary, teaches at Olds College, and writes about Black identity on the prairies. So welcome to Bertrand. Asante Houghton is another uh, person who will be joining us this evening. Passionate about social justice and equity, Asante Houghton is a national award-winning mental health advocate dedicated to endeavors aimed at building stronger communities. He is a peer worker, poet, thinker, and speaker who believes in people, global interconnectivity, and positive personal change. Asante's peer work has brought him across Canada to the United States, Colombia, and most recently, Ireland. Asante has also made noise as a two-time TEDx speaker, and he was recognized by CAMH as one of the top 150 difference makers in mental health in Canada. Finally, Asante was featured in the most recent Bell Let's Talk primetime documentary special. So welcome to Asante. Next, uh, I've got Truth Is. Over the years, through poetry and effective communication, Truth Is has dedicated much of her time and all of herself to the betterment of the community. Since 2006, Truth Is has been a multiple time individual slam champion, an 11 time national spoken word uh, slam team member, uh, participating in hundreds of slams. She has participated in several TEDx events and has graced the stage of the prestigious When Sisters Speak spoken word concert five times. More recently, she opened for legendary activist Angela Davis, was a recipient of the Ming Sok Lee Labor, Award, Labor Arts Awards, and was named to Guelph's top 40, under 40. 
So I just wanted to take a moment to say welcome and thank you and uh, you know, we are big a hearty hello to Bertrand and to Truth. And, uh, and then when Asante joins us, he will also be able to jump in with us. So I just want to make sure that folks understand the significance of this volume. There have been many books that have been put together that have Black voices in them. And several quite notable uh, anthologies have been done more recently. You know, Corrine Vernon did an excellent one on, uh, on Black voices on the prairies. Uh, you know, Whitney French did an excellent one called Black Writers Matter. And of course, there's the seminal volume, The Great Black North, that was co-edited by, by Kavon, um, by, by Kavon Cameron and, uh, uh, sorry, Valerie Mason John, who also contributed to this uh, to this anthology. But this one is notable because of the inclusion of those personal perspectives, so that when people look back in the future, they'll be able to see what people in this day and age were thinking about. And so we're going to have uh, each of the contributors. They're going to read a little bit uh, from their from their contribution, and so excuse me, there's going, I didn't give them each about five minutes to read a little bit from, from, from the book. So I'm gonna start off just by reading from the introduction. So folks have a, a good idea, really, of what they're about to hear and, and to witness. So the introduction of the book goes like this. African Anthology, Perspectives of Black Canadian Poets is a curated collection of poetry, essays, conversation, and short fiction from some of Canada's most accomplished, urgent, and inspiring creative voices. The language of Black writers from coast to coast has been incorporated within its pages to challenge you to reflect and respond to the realities of us. Experiencing this book is not meant to be a passive action for those who read it. The time for passivity in the face of challenges examined by the anthology's contributors demands more from you and demands that it happen immediately. Patience has been exhausted as surely as we are exhausted by the personal and communal impact of our racialized experiences. This book is both a celebration and a warning. It celebrates Black life, honors Black struggle, commemorates Black legacy, and trumpets Black triumph. It doesn't require anyone's permission to exist nor the approval of anyone else to claim victory. It is an unruly, noisy, free-flowing, multifaceted glimpse into what it means to identify as Black in the third decade of the 21st century in Canada. The stories are told from multiple vantage points rooted in unique yet familiar experiences and using a variety of literary devices and formats in both official languages. By choosing to include Black francophone voices from Quebec in this collection, we made the point of publishing these words en français immediately followed by an English translation to ensure their original meaning cannot be mistaken or misinterpreted. All works appear in the table of contents with their titles in the mother tongue of their authors as another way of reinforcing the honor we place upon the words of every contributor to the anthology. We wish to sidestep the confining prism of the two solitudes dynamic in favor of an expansive view of blackness that unifies us through our shared experiences rather than divides us based on the cultural identity squabbles of the white dominated Canadian political classes. We create our own history here and do so unapologetically and fiercely. Our stories once told cannot be untold. We tell them for our ancestors, for our descendants, for our contemporaries, for ourselves. We tell them for history, for our voices matter. And by recording them here, we ensure that the substance of our souls reflected in these pages will have a resonance long after we can no longer draw breath. We leave clues about the past for future generations of all origins through the publication of our words in the present. It is a gift intended for those from whom we borrowed the world we currently inhabit. We consider the recording of these words to be a solemn responsibility. This is not a publication created with casual intention. We are not naive. This is how we capture and transfer the work to those who will eventually pick it up and continue it one day. We hope this encapsulation of our creativity is enough. 
We believe the generations to follow us will be enough. We trust that by the time they inherit these words, that enough is enough. And so this is the, the setting for which we created this work. And I'm now gonna call upon each of our, uh, our contributors that are, that are on the call tonight to, uh, to share a, a, a little bit of what they've contributed to the anthology. So I'm gonna start by calling on Bertrand first. So I wanna bring Bertrand into the shot and we'll get Mr. Bickerstaff to, uh, to share from his contributions. Hey, Bertrand. Hey, Greg, thank you very much for that introduction and that reading as well. Um, just highlights the importance of this particular text that you have brought together for us all here. Um, I also want to thank uh, Valerie and uh, to some to so many books. I was unaware of this uh, bookstore. Now I'm not from Winnipeg, so how would I know, right? But it sounds like an excellent project, and I'm so glad that we've got things like that uh, on the prairie, scattered throughout the prairies. That's uh, a fantastic uh, venture. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I want to point out that I am in Calgary, which is in Treaty 7, and so I am um, sharing the land with the First Nations people here, the Siksika, the Pikani, the Gainai, as well as the Tsutina and the Stony Nakoda people, uh, who did not ask for anyone to show up on their land, but are now graciously sharing it with us. Uh, I am um, ecstatic about this anthology. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing that you brought together, Greg. And uh, I think that although we have certain examples from the past, as you mentioned with um, Valerie and Kevon's anthology, Great Black North, um, and uh, Karina Vernon's as well, I think that there are moments throughout time in which we have to just mark things. And I think that you, what you're doing is you're, you're marking this period of time for us now uh, because things shift and change. And as I was mentioning to uh, Truth Is before we came on, you know, there was a time in which you could count the number of Black Canadian poets on your one hand that were out there and circulating and recognized by the industry. Uh, I'm talking obviously about people like George Eliot Clark and Dion Brandt and uh, closer to home for me, Claire Harris. Now there are a number of others, obviously, but there are only so many who could uh, break into the uh, sphere of recognition. And so now we do live in a time in which the landscape is different. It has changed. There is more work to be done, um, but you are part of that work, and I feel that this anthology is doing that work. Now, uh, to move on to the work that I contributed to this um, anthology, um, I, I'm going to read a little bit from the essay that I produced, and I just want to uh, introduce it by uh, pointing out that, you know, my main struggle and my, uh, my artistic challenge has often been to uh, deal with this identity of being uh, Black, but being from the prairies at the same time. Um, we've probably heard about um, George Eliot Clark, who has mentioned many times before in his writings how uh, being Black and being Canadian are kind of like a, um, it's a hyphenated, but uh, a minus sign, a double minus sign. So you can be Black, but you can't be Canadian. You can be Canadian, you can't be Black, right? And I felt something of that specifically in the prairies, uh, in the prairie regions as well. Uh, but obviously, Canada has its Black history, its involved Black history, and the prairies have their involved Black history as well. And so what I'm going to read from you, for you today is uh, a little bit of my journey of coming to understand what my particular poetic identity could be as a Black person, as a Black poet, um, who is writing from and through the prairies. It's called An Alberta Rose for Black Canada. I'm just gonna read a couple of pages for you here, okay? An Alberta Rose for Black Canada. I am something of an August Wilson fan. The late great playwright's body of works strikes me, strikes two sympathetic chords with me. It is first of all, self-consciously ambitious, and secondly, it is rooted in the peculiarity of place. Sometimes known as the century cycle, Wilson composed a series of 10 plays that span the decades, the 10 decades of the 20th century. I love this kind of ambitious gesture. What is more remarkable 
is that apart from the third play in the cycle, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which many of you may know now, there's a film that has been produced by that. Denzel Washington is going through these uh, 10 plays and producing them on film. But other than this third uh, play, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, the grandness of this work is grounded in its intimate concern with African-American life from the vantage of a very local community, the Hill District of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am drawn to the idea that such a large work documenting the lived experiences in the living language of a people's history could simultaneously speak from such a specific place. More remarkably, Wilson's Pittsburgh cycle has not only been seen as a representation of black life in a small community in the north of Pittsburgh, but it has also been seen as a representative of the fabric of America itself, a dramatization of the entire nation's inner workings. This, to me, is the most compelling aspect of the work, that in rendering the overlooked historicity of an African-American life, making it visible, it renders visible the soul of the nation. Yet I never thought of this achievement as a model for my own work, much as I have been drawn to it throughout my life. On the surface, though, my interest is obvious. Wilson provides a foundational body of work in a genre that has largely excluded Black presence from its central concerns. In so doing, not only does he carve a space for Black voices, roles for Black actors, narratives for Black imaginations, he also emphatically reveals a tradition. In this way, he is not simply critiquing the dominant white imagination as incomplete, which it is. He is also pointing to a pre-existing imaginative and social presence that did not just pop up yesterday in the form of the latest exotic Black talent, but has a long-standing and consistently overlooked place. Because I'm from the prairies, I grew up with an understanding of Blackness as foreign. As such, I did not feel fully human. At best, I understood myself to be half a curious oddity, half a threatening outsider. I knew I was neither of these things, but there was nothing in the larger world to oppose the idea. In fact, most people reinforced me as a strange or threatening halfling, half here, half human, half other and else. There was no countering history on offer. There was no black history and none of the common signifiers of the prairies belong, a prairie belonging included me. In fact, they were often used to do the opposite. Oil fields, wheat lands and ranches were automatically understood as the territory of white people. Agriculture explained white presence. Even the national sport ignored me. Where'd you learn to skate? A curious par parent once inquired of me. I stared at him blankly. We were at a skating camp. I had just beaten the crowd favorite in a speed obstacle course. The camp was affiliated with the local hockey team. Obviously, I was on the hockey team. But the question, where did you learn to skate? Both ignored this logic and invoked hockey as the territory of whiteness. I was not, for example, asked in the same cheery tone, maybe, when did you get so good? Maybe also with a wink and a smile. Or what's the team gonna do with you now? Again, maybe with a wink and a smile. No, to me, the question sounded like it was aimed at my origins. That is, at my incapacity to belong. It was to my ears, another version of where are you from? And I think I will end there. Thank you very much, folks. I think that's probably enough for now. Thanks for listening. And uh, I really look forward to hearing the uh, rest of the contributors. That's great. Thanks so much, Bertrand. Beautiful. And uh, just love the work that you were contributing to the to the anthology so um i'm gonna i'm gonna spin off from there and we're gonna we're gonna bring it down to uh to guelph ontario to uh truth is and then we'll see uh see what truth's got on offer for us yeah so i am very excited uh very excited to be 
uh, sharing um, the, you know, the, the virtual space with you all. So hi, just over here trying to do my thing. Um, so, wow. Also, Greg, please remind me as soon as we're done here that I just need to get you like a new, uh, what's that thing called? Um, bio. <laughs> I don't know what that one's about and I am just thoroughly embarrassed. Anyways, I think I'm going to start um, by, um, uh, by, I, I, I'm going to read one of the poems um, and a little bit of, um, and a little bit of my personal essay. I think that, um, and that it will just best represent like where I ended up on the whole thing. So um, just give me a second here. And I'll look at this page. The perplexing element of puzzles have always been their charm. It's like sticking your hand in the mix and tussling possibilities so similar they seem impossible. It's like a dare to dream. Everything is in the small things. See the resilience and of the seemingly infinitesimal details that lead to the impressive view of a life we know and the one we can hope for. What's inside the box? Think outside of it. Know that there are always more things than what's on the cover. I'm still learning that muddling through a collection of trial and error will never be an easy task. But I know that many hands make ingenuity and the constant pursuit of perfection look like miracles regardless that there is no magic in these actions. Yes, I believe in personal ambition. But the point is to not ignore the strongest of mutual bonds when they encourage you well beyond the picture presented. Do not be so intent on categorizing every land and groove instead of trust the bit. Instead, trust the vision will come together because every piece is already there. Life, work, love is all a puzzle. The time it takes and the intention and the attention to details. There should always be those keen to help understand this. It takes a village, one filled with passionate, curious, and experienced. Those who value the difference between an outward stretch hand, palm face up, and a firm handshake. Those who make competition a race to be, be the best instead of just being better than. Those who are unafraid to try. Winning requires a goal. So show up and rise to the occasion, even en route back to the foot of the mountain. Sort through a problem piece by piece to get results bit by bit. When everything is puzzling, when you are constantly made to feel like something is missing, see similar shapes and possibilities and know that there's a good chance you'll find what you need to accomplish the big picture. The entire success of a puzzle relies on finding pieces that fit. Noticing an edge, the blend, the connection, choosing patience over frustration and the commitment to see something through to triumph. I am interested in true connection. I am here to discover and contribute enthusiasm to what's next. I am here to unite all unique elements in this box. I need to know that you can say the same. So when the last piece is placed, we can all say, wow, look what I've done. We've done our doing. We've been always been in this together. I really like that poem a lot because it's just like ever since I've been involved in spoken word community, it's just it's literally been about building community. Like the relationships matter um, and it's never easy. It's not an easy task. Um, and sometimes it's frustrating and sometimes you feel like you have to set things aside. But um, I, um, I have so much growth to do and I am standing on the uh, shoulders of, of giants in my opinion and I am, and 
and I'm unafraid to look out and I want to see what next next steps are available. So something like this, this anthology is, is definitely kind of one of those, this means that to me. And um, the last thing I kind of want to share is uh, in my, uh, the actual, the end, um, the end of, of my personal essay in which I really, it's been a whole journey. So I kind of feel like, yeah, if you've seen truth is around, you might kind of have an idea of who I am or whatever. And so I decided to go with uh, something um, a little more like, let's see, like look at the seed, look at the beginning of, um, of me before I even came to connect with this community. And I shared that bit. And now I just kind of want to leave you all with the last, my last thoughts when, when finishing um, that bit of writing. When I step off the stage, and onto it. When I step off the page and onto a stage, into a classroom, or I'm drawn to a slam festival back alley poetry cipher, I'm reminded of what an honest effort can look like physically and mentally. Sometimes it's a crisp and fresh, sometimes it's crisp and fresh laces washed and shaven. And yes, I did shave my laces, yes, haha, <laughs> back. Laces washed and shaven, and sometimes it's ugly crying, uncontrollably wiping snot off your pleather pants. I can't believe I actually told people about that. <laughs> I've had an obligation to every childhood and schoolyard friend, every teammate, local community member, national gathering, and to my son to incite worthiness. I'm older now, yet still when I say spoken words save my life, there is no word of a lie in that sentiment. The t-shirts I have are now very, very off-white and well-worn. One of the most recent things I've written speaks to something a mentor of mine imparted. She said, Every way we react to everything we experience is simply a unique expression of what it means to be human. So I wrote, always everyone wants your struggle to be something more tangible and more profitable to be real. So how can I tell you about the cracks we have fallen through? I've learned about the weight of shame, the one I'm supposed to be, about poisoning the body and what it means to carry home on your back and arrive with nothing. I've buried the dead, cared for the living, wanted to die and figured if I did, no one would care. In each, in each day I've learned about listening, when to speak and how to do it in a way that speaks volumes. All because at some point, sometime, someone couldn't didn't or did it well before me. I'm still learning to navigate it all. And the rest, as they say, is history. Thank you. That's brilliant, amazing. Thank you so very much. Truth is ellipsis is in the building. So awesome and I really appreciate that wonderful reading of your of your work, your contributions, truth, and deeply appreciative, of course, that you, you that you created it. And yeah, and just this is such an amazing project. I'm so yeah, like everybody who's in it, like I really was excited about having those people in it. But like truth and I go back now, back into the slam community, and I just felt like the voice that truth brings to this really needed to be represented. So thank you once again for being there. And on that note, we will pass over to the final contributor who is with us tonight. And that would be Asante Houghton. There he is. What's good, what's good? How you yeah. doing? 
Ah, you're good. You look happy, man. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, of course I'm happy because I'm here, man. What do you mean? <laughs> I've been thinking about this all day, all week. I'm just I'm so like words cannot express the amount of like gratitude and just how honored I am to be included in this anthology, man. We, we got some real giants. Like it's you know, sometimes I reflect and it's like it's really cool when your idols become your peers. You know what I'm saying? I do. And 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 for me, that's that's what's happened with with my inclusion in this anthology. And, and you know, what's really interesting for me is I, I kind of made my name as a speaker, right? You know, a lot of people didn't really know that I write or a lot of people didn't really know that, you know, I, I, I do poetry. I've been rapping since I was 15 years old. You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing to, to, to be noticed in that way and, and to have an outlet and to be included in all this. And um, I'm just really excited to be quite honest. I'm now just rambling. I don't know what am I supposed to be doing here, man? <laughs> Supposed to be reading from your your contributions to the to the to the anthology. So I'll I'll get off screen and allow okay. you to go ahead and do that very thing. Cool. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Um, yeah. So you know, the the story goes. Uh, Greg reached out to me. Uh, how long ago was it now? About a year and a half ago. A year something like that. This came together really quickly. First of all, Greg. So mad props for that. Um, but. You know, Greg reached out to me and, you know, we, we've known each other for several years now, just uh, in the mental health community, just doing things to try to, you know, improve the state of mental health for young people, black people, everybody, really. Um, and just, you know, we vibe. <laughs> we vibe, we vibe, you know how it is. Um, and anyway, you know, I guess, you know, Greg, one of the things I'm really grateful for is that you see me in a way that you know, I've been wanting to be seen for a lot of my life. Um, you know, I've always considered myself an artist, but, you know, I've always been seen as more of an intellectual, which is, which is cool, nothing wrong with that. But, um, you know, uh, you know, a big part of my life is being creative. And I often don't find that that part of me is highlighted as much by, you know, the people around me as, as I would have liked for it to be, or maybe this is, like issues I had when I was a kid because uh, <laughs> you know well you know part of my essay talks a little bit about the fact that I was I was a smart kid and I got good grades and you know they they, they kind of throw you out there as the mascot um, when, when you're the black kid who's you know overcoming poverty and adversity and single motherhood and all these different things and I was the poster child for all of that but I hated it because like Bertrand was saying earlier I didn't feel like a person because anyway, I'll, I'll get into it. Um, so I think it's a good segue into, into what I'm gonna do tonight. I'm gonna read a little bit from my essay and also read the entirety of my poem, which is not very long. Um, and you know, what they both focus on are my early discovery that code switching was, a, you know, was gonna provide me safety in the world, but also, the amount of shame that I felt while doing it, coming from a very proud Jamaican family. Um, and, you know, always, you know, a very, my, my mom was always very Afrocentric in the way we did things. There was just, you know, all the art on the walls had black people, Africans, Jamaicans, um, you know, this, this is kind of, this was my world at home. Um, black history was a big thing in, in my household. Just all these things were just, you know, really driven into me. And then I go out into the world and realize that all the things that were driven into me at home were the things that if I were to display them in the spaces that I was in at school, et cetera, that those things would render me unsafe in the world. So, um, you know, my contributions are really about that inner conflict of code switching in order to feel safe, to be safe, but, not liking the process, feeling ashamed, but also the loss of identity that can occur when you get so lost in constantly putting a mask on rather than being able to be in the world authentically. So did I say too much? Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit from, from uh, what I wrote in the essay and then we'll get to 
the, the poem. So the essay is called Safe. Uh, I'm gonna read a little bit from it. As an uncommonly observant child, even though I did not have the words to articulate it at the time, I was astutely aware of what was happening in my school. It was the same thing I saw happening with, Rodney, with the Rodney King verdict on the news and seemingly everywhere around me. My six-year-old observations led me to arrive at the unnerving conclusion that if you were black, you were perpetually in danger of being mistreated and the magnitude of this mistreatment seemed to correlate with the magnitude of cultural distance between black folks and white Canadians. In my six-year-old mind, I knew that for some reason, my culture and my skin tone made white folks feel threatened. After having witnessed what happened to my Jamaican classmate, who was expelled essentially, I became very motivated to make those who might punish me feel safe. This lack of safety was not just felt at school, but became even more apparent when both of my brothers were detained for fitting the description before they were even old enough to drive or when those same brothers were jumped by eight white supremacist boys in the lobby of the apartment building in which we, the gang and my family, all lived. It was clear to me, even at a young age, that the predominantly white world I lived in was unsafe for me and that my safety would, reply, would rely upon how safe white folks felt around me. So I made myself, quite intentionally, the safest black boy they would ever be around. And I was rewarded in spades. So um, <clears throat> that's a little bit from uh, the essay. So weird to do this when you can't see or hear people, but you know, <laughs> um, that's cool. Um, now I'm gonna read uh, the whole poem. It's called Unsafe. And well, you know, I'm just gonna get into it. I'm standing under your meter stick in the eyes of a menace. I try to survive the lies you don't even know you're telling in your melon, spreading false projections that I was a junior felon unless I was spelling every word true, unless I was pretending to be you. What could I do but put on a brave face, the same face I saw everywhere around me, alabaster heroes out to catch the zeros dipped in tar who can only go as far as the chains let them, as the pain sets in, I remain clenching, sustained wretching, thinking they should be ashamed stepping in and out of evil, looking through the peephole at my people, looking for a weak spot to needle. Now I'm praying forever that never isn't the measure of when I can escape the pressure because y'all cold like December and I'm falling. So now I'm in a crisis, identity, identity divided by nefarious devices of TV pundits whose advice is to fear everything that my life is. So now I'm wearing two masks, neither of them mine. Functioning fine is the machine that got me dysfunctional. Why? I keep shaking. Why it's not safe in this world that I'm in when I'm in this skin, me and my kin. Even if we bend to every whim, the scoreboard empty and we just can't win. So how can I make a dollar without talking proper? How can I be a doctor without doctoring the doctrine embossed in my melanin, my impediment perceived by you, received by you? So now I shape shift into makeshift versions of you and me, of me and you. The world is unsafe with the glass opaque in the mirror of my mind that I'm seeing through. Now that I'm older, it's hard to see it through. This farce of dramatic arts that jump starts the quartering of my heart, lying to myself about my militants. What an ironic predicament, unsafe inside and outside, because now the outside is inside. So now I'm inside, because outside leaves my palms sweaty and mouth dry. Everywhere I look, I see the looks of distrust. No wonder I mistrust the consequences of being seen. Now I'm cautious, permission to see me only through the veneer of the mask I wear, the insincere grin on the face of my alabaster fear. That's what I got for y'all. Um, yeah, you know, um, thank you everybody uh, who's, who's here. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know what to say right now, but uh, you know, for me, like all of that is just a reflection on, you know, just all the inner workings of, you know, what I've been experiencing for most of my life. and. Um, you know, through over the pandemic, I finally grown my hair out. I wanted to grow my hair out like this since I was like 12 or 13 years old and I'm 36 now. Um, and for me, it's just a way to be in my body in a way that feels authentic for me in a way that I've never really had the, I never really embraced before because I didn't feel like it was viable to 
to be this way, you know, to show up like this and to still be able to put food on, on the table uh, for my family. So, you know, for me, when we talk about liberation and, and things of that nature, it really boils down to the basic elements for me. And, you know, it, it's about opportunity to, to opportunity to thrive. It's about opportunity to put food on, on one's table, to put a roof over your head, clothes on the backs of your children, and to have a community that can be left alone to just be who they are. So um, that's that's kind of what I'm working toward in, in my life and in the messages I'm trying to send, um, you know, doing EDI work, and which is always a precarious <laughs> environment to be <laughs> um, but you know, try my best to to really navigate and wrestle with different sides of my experience, and to hopefully, you know, tell a story or paint a picture that helps the experience of other young black folks get through this world with a little bit more sanity than I was able to get through it when I was younger. So that's what that's all about. Thank you, everybody. That's power. That's real power, my friend. Thank you so much for for everything that you've shared. Uh, and thank you to Bertrand and to Truth. You can bring everybody in now um, for, for the sharing uh, that you've done. And I think what I, where we're at now in, uh, in the program is, uh, is a place at which where we can have that conversation. So, so now with the, with the four of us, of course, we, you know, we are a portion of the uh, of the con of the contributors to the full anthology. I mean, we've got folks like you know Bertrand mentioned. You know, there's you know George Early Clark is in this collection. We've got the great Olive Senior in this collection. Um, you know, uh, we've got you know out on the west side. We've got you know Valerie Mason John. We've got Cicely Bell Blaine. We've got the great uh, you know contributor to the Vancouver scene. Uh, Wade Compton is represented. Then you fly out to the west, or sorry, to the east side, and we've got a Fua Cooper in the collection, um, you know, and Tondaway McCarthy, who's one of the co-founders of the New Brunswick Black Artists Alliance, which is brand new and is the first time that Black artists in New Brunswick have ever organized themselves uh, to be represented with their voices. And, you know, Evelyn C. White, who is the, uh, the official uh, biographer uh, for Alice Walker, She's in our collection. And then when you come back into Quebec, we have these three amazing Francophone poets, you know, Chloe Savoie Bernard, and Webster, and, uh, and, and Rodney St. Alois, the great Rodney St. Alois, two time Governor General Literary Award winner for French language poetry. We have some incredible, incredible contributors. And so one of the things that just happened, I published an article that was in All Lit Up um, over the weekend. And the article speaks actually directly to the theme that we're discussing tonight, which is, you know, that Black folks, in order to get the fullness of what it means to, to be Black in Canada, to understand Blackness in Canada, you have to take our voices in aggregate. There is no one single source of, of knowledge. So when you think about, you know, what does it mean to be a part of the Black community? Like what does what does that term bring up for you? And uh, on this one, I'll I'll start with truth. Like what is what does that term bring up for you? The black community. Um, what is can you say what is the black community? Yeah, like what does that term mean to you when you hear it? Like, what what is, does it resonate? Does it make sense to you? Like, is it is it explanatory of anything? like it's it's weird because like it feels like it's the same thing it feels home like that it feels like very comfortable Ooh, the black community y'all that's that's really that's like you know the the spoken word version like the cookout like you just go in there and you're gonna grab a plate and the food's nice and the and the people's gonna get you like automatically on some level, like, you know, they're gonna, you're gonna have some uh, common experience. Um, but it also at sometimes, especially like coming up through the, the, the Canadian spoken word or slam scene, it also felt very like isolating in a way, like there was this whole other world outside of that, that, that safe space. 
Um, like, you know, you're like, oh, this that comfortable space. Like there was something outside of that, um, that you, it, it costs. It, there was, there was a, a, like a, a cost to, to play. And so it's, it's one of those, when I hear that, I, I get very like, I immediately have to like, hmm, okay. I have to think about how I'm going to navigate, you know, I hear that and like, you know, do it can, um, and like how I'm going to navigate both communities or do like, you know, knowing that there is more than one and that it's never, and it doesn't feel united, even though I'm like spoken word. I love the whole thing like I want to go like when I was coming up I didn't care like I was like oh there's an open mic I'm on it I didn't care what it what it was labeled as and I wanted to be in those spaces and I wanted to share my truth um but so when I hear when I hear things like um a black space I I kind of feel like it's also um it feels like coming home but it also feels like a challenge to be like define like to redefine what that even looks like yeah for sure um do either one of you gentlemen want to jump in right away or sure i can throw something out um the, it's a great question craig um because i think as uh, truth just helped to share it's sort of a double-edged sword right so on the, on the one hand you hear black community and you know this is a thing that just hems you into a category. Uh, you know it's a monolith um, and you know because it comes from a certain perspective. So we never even used to talk about communities for the longest time. And I think community became this word, like it used to just be like people, right? Black people, right? And then community was this word that came in with, you know, immigration and waves of immigrants coming in and slightly more liberal white people wanting to identify them more than just as a monolith, right? So now they're community, right? But it's still distinguished them from white people, right? It's just, they're still, they're not, they're not normal people, like they have community, right? Um, on the other hand, I do feel, and Truth mentioned this too, I do feel that there is something quite powerful in that notion of black community, whatever that is, right? You yourself have just finished describing to us how diverse and aggregate that so-called community is, right? It's East Coast, West Coast, it's all kinds of different people um, with different histories all mixed up in there. Uh, and I feel that part of the magic, though, that can happen with Black community, as Truth said, the moment you connect with somebody who you know identifies in that same community, you at least know that you're, you share a certain uh, experience of being boxed in. Like, you know automatically that there's that shared experience and you can at least just be a human being rather than a people or a community that uh, white people do uh, throw at us. So I think the magic there is that there's something about black community that allows us to have this sort of slippery kind of fluid uh, access to each other that we can all flow together and we can access it and we can grow strong from it and we can consolidate and feel like we are a people. But at the same time, I think we recognize more than others that that consolidation does not in any way mean monolith. It simply means this is what we're reduced to. These are the relationships that we have invented in order to survive whatever it is out there that you, you've placed on us. Yeah, uh, that's, that's big. Um, Santi. Yeah, you know, I, I think about this all the time, you know, because I'm frequently in white spaces educating white people about racism. <laughs> um, you know, um, but, you know, I, I guess for me, the Black community, again, like everyone's saying, it's not monolithic, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, you know, I, I look at it from two sides. Like, what does it mean? What does that term mean internally among Black people? But what does that term mean externally outside of the, the sphere of Blackness? You know what I mean? And, you know, internally, it's a lifeline. You know, that, that's the way I've always seen it. It's all, for me, it's always been like, this is how I keep my sanity. This is, you know, what I need to hold on to. 
to make sure I, I don't get lost in the world um, because it's very easy to get lost in the world when, you know, I don't know, for me, it was always this thing where people were often pushing me, you know, academically. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when you're a kid, when you're being pushed academically, it means you end up in these spaces where nobody looks like you. So, you know, for me to connect with myself and my community, my people, it was something I was, I was always seeking. Um, I, it was like, it didn't have to find me. I was always just reaching toward it and going toward it. Um, and it was my lifeline because, you know, I, I was performing all the time in these spaces that where, where no one looked like me. And, you know, I was performing either academically or I was performing, you know, with, with you know, I was changing my voice to make sure I don't sound too black for these people. Otherwise they might discriminate against me. Um, you know, so to be able to be a part of a community for me was a lifeline, you know, and, and I really found that through hip hop, you know, that was, that was my entryway into all of it. And that, that was kind of, you know, for me, I fell in love with hip hop when I was a teenager because it told stories I can relate to, right? Because I grew up in the projects and I grew up in a very challenging way. You know, all the things that happen in poor neighborhoods in the projects with black people, like the stories I was hearing the music were the stories I saw all around me all the time. I was like, finally something that speaks to me and I can relate to. So I latched onto it. Um, and, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, you know, up until recently, you know, hip hop and, and black people were very synonymous. Um, so, you know, for me, that was really important, but then, you know, externally people, again, it's, the black community is used in this very reductive way where it's like all of y'all are the same all of y'all speak the same language you dress the same dance the same eat the same foods you know <laughs> all of it and it's like it's not like that at all not even like between ethnicities or nationalities but even in the same neighborhood even in the same household it's like you know there was so much diversity in my household in terms of like our interests I mean, we're all into sports, but, you know, like my, my oldest brother, like, you know, he was kind of, uh, you know, he was the, the visual artist. That was his thing. And, you know, my, my middle brother, he was the athlete and me, I was kind of the nerdy kid. And, you know, so like even within like our household, we were so different and it always used to frustrate me and it still does that people want to put blackness in a box right and there is no box for us you know and i think for some i think sometimes we can get tricked into believing that that box exists but it's you know it's a bunch of bullshit really and and you know for me i've tried to live my you know not just my childhood life but my adult life like vociferously trying to break out of this box just all the time i don't want anyone to be able to define me in one particular way which is probably why i inhabit so many different spaces but right. yeah anyway go yeah. ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah. gotta, gotta slow your roll a little bit there Asante. You, you got you got going there my friend um <laughs> but, but i do want to riff on this idea of the box right because i think i think so many of us uh in our in our experiences of blackness at some way you know at some point along the way felt like somebody was trying to cram us into one box or another in order to suit whatever was happening in that particular moment i mean i know a uh, truth in, in your essay you sort of allude to that in certain ways right um bertrand you certainly talk about it a lot uh, of the time from from your prairie experiences growing up in alberta and I mean, and obviously, Asante, you've just spoken about it. So when we think about, you know, the community and about the people who are in a box, the, the voices that are in the book, and this book representing maybe a way out of the box or something, um, what, do you, what do you see in terms of your writing, in terms of the poetry, uh, you know, that, that, that you're creating? Do you view that as one way for you to rebel against being pigeonholed or stuffed into a particular box, into a particular perception of who or what you're supposed to be? Do you, do you feel those kinds of pressures 
or is that something that doesn't really affect your writing? Um, I'll go to Bertrand first this time. I do feel it. I feel that that is one of the key things that my poetry does, that it challenges that box. Now I realize that the, because I'm working in the realm of poetry, poetry itself is a, a box in and of itself, and it already has labels attached to it. So um, even people who don't read any poetry, if you say the word Shakespeare, they're like, oh yeah, wow, oof. they already know. So it, it comes with that stuff attached to it. So I think that when I write that poetry, I'm always in danger when I'm engaging that medium, I'm always in, in danger of uh, um, reinvoking all of those elements of poetry, like it's high culture, it's European, it's for white people, right? But at the same time, even if I just write a straight up um, sonnet, iambic pentameter, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, rhyming every other line, I am still challenging it because people like us are not seen as people who can produce that sort of thing, right? So I don't just write iambic pentameter and things like that. I don't, obviously. But even if I did, I would say it would still be a challenge. Just being in the halls of poetry, for me, feels like it's a challenge. Because for us, it's always our presence that is the, the problem, right? And so I will put my presence wherever it can be. And I feel that that, that does challenge things. So yes, for me, that's the answer. Amazing, amazing. And really deep, Bertram, thank you. Um, uh, I agree. Can I, can, can I just step in there, Rel, and be like, I'm with that? Um, when I was, I, I kind of mentioned a little bit before, but I think that I was and still am like very much like if you speaking your truth, then, then it belongs wherever you have the opportunity to speak. And that sometimes you're creating space, that means creating spaces, sometimes that's just going and disrupting things. And that's why I I was, just, I'm like, sometimes when I'm performing, like you come in and you're like, oh shit, this is so passionate or something. And I'm like, I'm like, like I just feel like I am like this, uh, this square peg, you know, that's just slightly bigger than that round hole. And then my poetry sometimes just feels like, like I ha just hammering, like coming down and being like, no, oh, we gonna fit. Oh, we, oh, we gonna learn today. <laughs> like, this is something that needs to be said. So yes, it, it most certainly is, but it's kind of like, I, I, I'm under the, the, the thought that it like, without really thinking about it, I'm under the thought that it's it's my, like it just feels right to me that it's my responsibility um, to do that. So I don't really think too, I, like I don't na like navigate like, oh, do I have to in this space? Now, uh, as much as like in terms of like when I'm writing, when I'm performing, I will choose different poems for like that, I feels that suits the moment the best or try not to um, that will create the most comfortable um, atmosphere for my my poetry to receive um, I will but for the most part like you you can't not think about it but it's just one of those things you gotta like you're like mommy I got I got there's work to be done and I can't I can't I can't sit back on it so yeah, do it anyways. <laughs> right. So does that give you does that give you an additional sense of, of freedom or or do we feel a certain level of responsibility to be the disruptive or is it just let's just go into the space, do what we need to do and, and whatever happens happens like is there is there does there need to be a concerted effort to reject the box or to disrupt or, or, or what have you? I just think there needs to be people given the opportunity to like be I feel like you will naturally do that like you're gonna create like you are not it's not no one's going and being like yeah I'm gonna go I mean I have done it before like go in it's like a rock open mic and I'm like oh I'm about to do some poetry about some social justice issues like yeah 
I totally knew that that wasn't gonna be like the scene. Um, and of course I'm like, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna disrupt things. But for the most part, I think just, um, just believing that we are enough, that we have like our voices and our stories have worth and that like just sharing them is, it shouldn't be considered disruptive. It, it should be like a part of the, the narrative. Um, so yeah. Sure, I, I, and I see Asante champing at the bit to just toss in a little bit here. So go ahead, Asante. Yeah, you know, I think, I think that being authentically ourselves is being disruptive to that box. You know what I mean? Um, I love that you played hockey growing up, Bertrand. I love that, man. To be, I love it because it breaks the narrative, you know what I mean? And I work with, you know, I work with a lot of young people. Um, I work with a, a lot of young people from, you know, marginalized communities. And one of the challenges I see with them is they're constantly, at, at a certain point, they almost relent to this box that, it, that they're being put in. And they say, these are my limitations. These are my walls. So for me, my whole steez like is just, I'm trying to break this box all the time. You know, I, I want to, I'm constantly trying to be the unexpected. And, you know, when I was young, I was constantly, I, I, I was doing that unintentionally and feeling a lot of shame for it because I was like, you know, people were like, yo, you're black, but what kind of black are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and they're always trying to figure it out. It's like, hey, are you the rapper? Are you the athlete? Are you the nerdy guy? Are you, you know, the creative guy? Are all these, and it's like, I'm all of these things at the same time. Why can I not, you know, be all of these things in one body, in one person? Why do I need to be one of them? Why do I need to be reduced to that? So for me, I'm just trying to set an example, uh, you know, for the young people I'm around, in, including my children, and, and to, to essentially say that the greatest power you have as a black person, maybe not the greatest power, but one of the greatest ways for you to be in the world is to be just who you are. No matter what anybody has to say about it. So that, that's kind of how I feel about it. That's power, that's power. And so I guess before we just throw it open to the other folks who are listening here, I just want to maybe put something else out there. So. We, you know, we, we, we grow up and we, and, we, and we go through these experiences. We've become uh, artists, we've become creative people. We write our feelings. We write our feelings and give them to other people to read and to tell us what they think of who we think we are. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing when you think about it that way, right? But, you know, as we do this and, you know, we see we, we continue to collect uh, people's voices, we collect people together and we do this together, and we've, and we've managed to do this successfully because I, you know, I, I believe this, this volume is a, is a, is a successful uh, compendium of, of many of these voices. Where do we go from here? So if, we are, if we're not a monolith, but we are viewed monolithically and we can bring together uh, you know, disparate, wide ranging, uh, a cacophony of voices and place them into a book, and we can and we can continue to do this. And there's other people who are out there who are doing it too. Like, what does the what does the future of blackness look like in terms of our ability to join together or to be ourselves or to be you know the multiple in unity that we happen to be be the sticks in the bundle that I referred to at the beginning of the of the book? How do we do that successfully and in ways that honor our individualness but also acknowledge you know the communal? wants to jump on that. Are you going to ask us such a deep question like that, man? <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Asante. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on it. And, you know, I, I don't know if I have the answer, you know. But it, I guess the, the thing that really caught me when you were speaking was the future of Blackness, right? Um, and I think about this all the time because I feel like for those of us who are descendants of slaves, the future of blackness is a constant question and it has always been a constant question in the sense of being, having your culture and, and your, 
the history it ripped away from you places you in a position of recreation because it's, it's hard to ever maybe even impossible to ever reach back into and in, in, reach back into time to grasp that history and to bring it into who you are today in such a way where it's like you know like i don't know what my roots are going back after four generations back i don't know where i'm from so you know one of the challenges for me is has always been how do i anchor myself and, and i think when we say the future of blackness i think a lot of it is just saying f everybody else and really focusing on us and what we are who we are and being kind of and again just showing up authentically mm -hmm. as much as we possibly can um uh -huh. so yeah you know i think i'll leave it there but you know i i well the last thing i'll say is that you know i i see bright things in the future <laughs> to be quite honest um you know just being around all these young people man I, i'm talking like i'm old but being, <laughs> being around all these all these younger people um I just have so much hope for the future because I see how much confidence they have in themselves. Right. Where in my generation that I was growing up in, we had to work for that confidence. We had to really like search it out. And with, you know, with these guys who, and you know, people I should say, who are 25 and younger, I just feel like there is a, it's much more inherent to them. Their, their value is much more inherent to them than I think me and my peers felt where we had to really go out there and search for it and find it and fight for it um you know so i, I really do see positive things happening and I'm, I'm hopeful for the future and what we're we're able to create you know I, i'm saying too much i'm gonna stop there and, and <laughs> let others speak that's power power um uh which one of you would like to go next i'll go go ahead bertrand we'll, we'll, we'll give truth the last word i know she sure. Heard. Like that. I think Asante really summed it up very nicely because I think when you ask the question of, you know, how do we still succeed as Black community? What's the future of Blackness? I think you have to ask yourself, well, what is the success that we're talking about exactly? What is this? What, what does that mean? And on this continent, certainly, it means that we are just seen as human beings and that that whole thing, human beings who have a legitimate place on this um, uh, uh, on this continent, who can be here legitimately uh, with other human beings. And I think that thing about, um, I just lost my train of thought, actually. Um, uh, shoot. Well, I think the thing about um, just creating, just allowing us to be creative, that's the thought I was going to say. I think that in and of itself is very powerful because we don't, um, we don't have the same kind of privilege that white people have when it comes to being able to name and define themselves. We don't have that. We have to act against what has already been stamped upon us, right? And so I think when we create, when we create, we can do things like create our own communities. For example, this anthology that you've, you've brought us together in, this is a kind of community now that we have. And there was a time in which there were only a handful of black writers that you could point to on the scene. Now, there are lots of them. Okay? There was only a time in which there was one anthology. Now there are lots of anthologies. There used to be only one or two black hockey players to go back to that theme, Asante. Okay? When I was just young, I mean, there was Grant Fuhrer and I don't know much more after that, right? Okay? Now there's many, you can say there is a community for sure. And I think the more we are given the space and the time to keep creating, the more we will start populating all of these different areas more and more. And then who knows, you know, I don't know, but maybe we'll uh, reach a point in which we can just be seen as human because we're just everywhere. I That's agree all. with that um, in the sense that uh, I just think that our future looks, it looks fiercely average. And I'm very okay with that. You know, it looks like every day, it looks mundane. It looks, 
it just, it looks like my every day. That's like, you know, and I want that for everyone. All the privileges that I have to speak, to write, to, to you know, be that goofball, to be that smart and nerdy athlete, hockey player, do like whatever. Like, it just is. I'm like, that's not really that cool. And, or that's not really that exciting. Or that's not really that different. Oh, another one? Cool, cool. Cause like, I just want it to be, I'm okay. I like, I want it to be like that, that, that vibe when you're like, you know, you're sitting on a beach and you're just watching the waves and it's just, you know, it just is, it's just pleasant. It's just nice. And that's, that's what I want. That's what I actually see. I just see us just moving in harmony, just doing our, our natural in and out and, you know, just growing and creating our scenes. And it won't be like, ooh, is that a black person? Oh, shoot. Like, you know what I mean? It's not, it's, I, I see a future for us in which we can be ourselves and that is enough. And we have worth and it is, and we have comfort. Um, and I see those things and it, it's, it's not in the immediate future, but it's something that I can, I can see us working uh, towards uh, quite, quite naturally. I think we're just, we're just doing it. We're just like, you know what? I'm like, instead of just, you know, uh, always coming against that, the, the identity that's been stamped upon us as, as, uh, as Bertrand has, has, has mentioned. Um, I think it's just gonna be, it's gonna be like, like us just, our lives are this, the, just washing, it's just the waves, it's just coming in and just polishing those stones and just moving things along. Or, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't find it incredibly exciting and I long for that day. And I am, as I mentioned uh, just before the, the, the show, I am, I'm just building my shoulders. I'm building my shoulders wide. I'm building them so they're strong. And so that like, who's, who's next? Get up, get up. I'm like, let's see what's, what's out there uh, further. Uh, like, so you can see further. Cause from what I can see, I'm like, ooh, this look good. Maybe we need another angle, get up there. Was, there's work and um and it's and I am and I am there for it. That's brilliant. Thank you, thank you, folks, so much. And um, I'm gonna just uh, I'm gonna go to the chat box. We've got a question in there from Valerie. Thank you so much, Valerie. And it just says, "Thank you to all the panelists for sharing your work." My question is for Asante, but of course, others can jump in too. In your poem, you said, "How can I make a dollar without speaking proper?" And earlier you talked about the safety that code switching offered versus the shame you felt for doing it. I'm wondering where you are now with that and what you would say to others, perhaps newer black immigrants experiencing similar challenges. And also, how do you think or hope society in general should respond to accents? It's another deep question. Um, <laughs> thank you, Valerie. Um, you know, I try to code switch as little as possible these days. So when I walk into a management meeting, this is how I show up now, <laughs> you know, and I just talk the way I talk to all of you, the way I talk to my friends, the way I talk to my family. Um, and for me, it's, it's to not code switch. I'm not saying I don't code switch because I'd be lying if I, if I said that, but I try to reduce the amount that I code switch. And it's, a, it's an act of rebellion for me to not code switch because at a certain point, I realized that my code switching was not aligning with my actual goal, which was to open doors for Black people, because what the the you know what the others will call them were seeing was you know not a real version of me and you know the people I grew up around and you know how we would show up, right? So. I was kind of like, am I really making a difference or am I just carving out a space for the code switched version of myself rather than, you know, those who might come after me? So it was about five years ago now where I'm like, I'm going to try to just stop doing this um, because I, I want 
for me to be able to show up with a gold chain and my hair like this and to not you know enunciate every word perfectly and to make basketball analogies for everything <laughs> and, and and the reason being is because I know that the work that is behind what I like, the work is good. So for me, I'm like, if I produce value and good work and I look like this and I show up this way, people who come after me will benefit from that because they won't have to modify themselves as much as maybe I did in order to even access this space. So that's one part. Uh, that's one answer for me. Um, the other part is, you know, uh, what do I think about, you know, uh, I think society, I think Canada does a really shitty job at integrating immigrants properly, if I'm being quite honest. Um, I think that we are encouraging immigrants to assimilate. And I think that we do not honor the, the lived experience and the professional experience, especially of immigrants when they come to this country. And, and I think it's a, it's a huge injustice. Um, generally speaking, and as far as accents go, I love them. I, I, I love accents. Um, I love when people can, you know, I love when people don't conform to adopting a Canadian accent because they spent 25, 30 years in a different country before coming here. You know, um, I want to normalize that, right? You know, and so for, for me, I, 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 I really think that we as a society, and you know, we need to stop saying to our children, to each other, you know, to, to make your accent go away. I don't want to use the white voice on the phone anymore. You know what I mean? Um, because I, I think there's there's I think in keeping our accent, it's keeping a part of ourselves. And when we lose that part of ourselves, it's easy to lose ourselves completely. And then, you know, again, I'm a mental health guy. So then, you know, for me, it just introduces all these other challenges emotionally, psychologically, uh, and makes it really hard to exist in the world. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm hundred percent for accents all the time. And I, I wish mine was deeper if I'm being quite honest with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you, you know what I mean? Like I grew up in a Jamaican family as you did. And, you know, and you, you listen to, you listen to people and, you know, you, you get, you get the Patwa and all of it, you know, and of course now I speak that interesting, like Canadian creolized Toronto accent that, you know, that, that wants to pull on Jamaican influence a lot, but, you know, can only, can only sort of skim the, the surface. It just skims the cream off the top of it. Um, but doesn't really get all the way into the mixture. So I think that, you know, the, the, the accent thing um, for me is really about, well, how society should respond to accents is to say that in society, there are accents and we just have to recognize and, and, and just be okay with the fact that there are other people who have different accents and don't get upset because you heard somebody talk who speaks with a Guyanese accent or speaks in Ukrainian accent or speaks in a Jamaican accent or speaks like they come from from the American South. It doesn't matter, bro. As long as they're, you know, as long as they are communicating in such a way that they can be understood, then that's the only thing that should matter. That's the purpose of language is simply to be understood. So as long as I can understand you, what, what does the rest of it matter? What does the rest of it matter? Anyway, um, I don't know if Bertrand or Truth want to jump in on that, but that's sort of my feeling. Not it. And one thing very quickly, because you guys have touched on everything already, um, and that is that um, uh, accents or the um, problem with accents is just a fallacy, frankly. As you just pointed out, Greg, it's impossible to speak without an accent. Everyone has an accent. And one thing I noticed when uh, I was going through my early phase of code switching as well. And, you know, when I was young, I didn't even realize I code switched uh, going back and forth. Yeah. But then when I got older and realized it happened, there was a period in which I deliberately was spoke like this, enunciated, and I'm the professor. And then there was a period in which I was uh, more rebellious. And when I could grow my hair, I had hair like yours, Asante, and I did all of that stuff as well. And what I came to realize is that, you know, 
I can just choose the, they're both of my authentic me, both of them are, and I can choose either one of them and I'm okay with it. I don't care about how anyone else looks at it. Uh, and this was a realization to me when I used to, um, I had this uncle, he died unfortunately a couple of years ago, but um, he's been living in Calgary for, I don't know, 45, almost 50 years. And he sounds like he just moved from Sierra Leone last week, right? He just, he, you can barely, like he's got that thick accent. And for many years, I used to always think, oh, wow, he's been here for so many years. Why does he still speak like that? And then one day it hit me. He doesn't have a strange accent. He is speaking English how everyone in Sierra Leone speaks English. And because these English people went around the world making other people speak English, now there are many kinds of Englishes that are all around the world. And these people are not struggling to speak English if, if they come from one of those countries. They're just speaking it in their accent. That's their English. And that is as legitimate as you said, Greg, someone from Texas or someone from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine or someone from the West of England, right? It doesn't matter. We all are just speaking with an accent. And so I'll leave it at that. Accents are a fallacy. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So um, I know that we're at, uh, we're at the half hour. So we're, we're sort of at the end of the time frame. So if each one of you can just like, in like 10, 15 seconds, just say a little quick goodbye, and then uh, I'll turn it back over to Valerie. So um, uh, uh, Asante, if you wanna go first, just say a quick, just a quick, see you later. <laughs> That's a challenge for me, um, but I do wanna say thank you to everybody who uh, is here tonight, everyone who bought the book, who's gonna read the book. Um, it means everything in the world for all of us, I think. Um, speaking for myself, it means everything for me, and I, I thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, that's that's all I got. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Truth, go ahead. Uh, just want to extend a thank you to everyone who's who's watching. Uh, uh, Greg for um, connecting me, putting me on this anthology, and everyone who's going to buy the book. I'm hoping that you'll enjoy it. I'm looking very, I'm I'm very much looking forward to enjoying it myself, and then and then really getting to know. Um, my community um, a bit uh, more and get in, in contact and hear those stories behind all the great work that's been done. So uh, thank you much, uh, very much everyone um, and uh, have a good night. Awesome. And Bertrand, you go ahead, sir. Yes, so uh, I do also echo the uh, words of uh, my colleagues, my peers here. Thank you all very much for coming and, and um, uh, supporting us in this venture. Uh, I want to point out that I think that this is an important uh, venture that we are involved in here. It is our community. And um, if there is anybody out there who is listening and who has been inspired by this, I want you to know that more will come. More will come from Greg, certainly, but more will come from you as well, because communities create communities. And these are the kinds of projects that create others like it. So those of you out here who came and enjoyed it and envisioned this sort of thing could be for you, yes, it could be for you. And I encourage you to go out there and grab that apple and run with it. <laughs> I don't know where that metaphor came from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Many thanks once again to Asante, to Truth, to Bertrand, to all of you who came to attend tonight. Thank you to uh, Nathan Frechette and the Renaissance Press who really helped us to get this project together and put it out there. Uh, this is the book right here, African Anthology Perspectives of Black Canadian Poets. It is available everywhere that books are sold in this country. And the most important one of those places is gonna be at Tosomi Books. So thank you to Valerie, to the entire team at Tosomi for what you've done, uh, for helping us to put this event together, for being the host and our partner in this. There's just so much a love and appreciation um, to you for this. And uh, I'll leave you, uh, Valerie, to have the last word. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. So first of all, Greg and Nathan did most of the work in putting this together. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you um, for, for everything that you've done for Tosome Books and for all of us who are here uh, participating or listening. So yeah, thank you for, for all your work. Uh, for the panel, thank you for such a rich discussion. Um, 
I definitely feel like I've learned so, so much. And I'm sure everyone else who is in attendance here um, has gained a lot from this event as well. To the participants, thank you all for coming. Um, I want to let you know that I have a copy of the book for each one of you. So just head over to tosomebooks.com. Um, it should be one of the first books on the page there. So get your copy. I'll keep it here for you until your order comes in. Um, so once again, thanks everyone. I hope you had a good evening. If you have any questions, you know, that you think of after the event, please feel free to send them my way and I will send them to whoever you would like to, you know, wh whoever you'd like to answer your question. Yeah, so that's it from me from Tsome Books and have a lovely evening.